that's what that's what people have to think about. So the first thing is that the is that the prophecy or the so called prophecy, you understand, of, of going to heaven so called after you die is false. And I know a lot of folks don't want to hear this and even I and I ourselves who've had loved ones who have died or passed on, um, though I already knew that that was not how it went, you know, that's not what the Bible teaches. That's a false prophecy. You understand? So the prophecy is false. Just like Matrix Movie 2 or the sequel, you understand, where Neo discovered that there was a false prophecy. Now, that's a reflection of the real false prophecy, you know, saying that many people have been led to believe. Now, we saw this particular um, <clears throat> magazine here, Tomorrow's World, and we showed the cover before. We'll show the cover again right here where it's speaking about your prophesied future. Now, notice what they're doing. They have a telescope. They are looking at your prophesied future, but then... In your um, counterfeit, you know, Christianity, if you're looking at the stars, most so-called Christians will say this is um, um, sorcery or witchcraft or astrology or something, and they turn the people away from it. But yet, the so-called leaders of these of these groups and people, and at the higher levels, they're studying the so-called stars because there's something up with the stars, this is what we're promoting, you know, this particular book. We've been waiting for for a moment, you know, to to publish it and and even working on actually getting this volume right here together so it's available now for I and I Rastafari and the Rastafari and Line of Judah Book Club, you know, www.lojsociety.org. Get a copy of, of this one if you can and, and also... Um, Cannabis, cannabis matrix right here. You understand? Now, this is all connected with this whole idea of the heavens in 2012 and, and all that's going on. So we read a portion of this article a little bit um, earlier in a, in a previous video, and we want to continue with this idea because most of the professing so-called Christians, they believe that to be saved or one of the saved that you will go to heaven at death. You know, yet you would think that if that were true, right, if, if they believe that that's true, why don't they learn about the heavens? But, but you see, it's kind of like a, a double, almost like a double cross in a sense. You go into the heaven after you die, they say, right? And if you start to um, learn about the heavens, you know, or the witness that's in the stars, what the Bible, based, what's at the root of interpreting the Bible rightly. And then we can really see the correspondence between some of the so-called ancient and primitive people, you understand, who so-called looked up at the stars or so-called worshipped the stars. Maybe all of them didn't, quote, worship the stars in the sense that some have led you to be naive, you understand, especially if their um, prophecies and predictions of certain things have been more accurate than even modern science. Modern science has a lot to learn, but let's look at the professing Christians for a moment, right? But most of them who believe that they're going to go to heaven after they die, they have little or no idea about what they're going to do in heaven, much less where they're going to go in heaven. You know, I mean, from what you know, if you've studied a little bit about the stars and the heavens and so forth and so on, remember, when you when you approach God from a Judeo-Christian perspective, we, we, we worship the one who created the heavens, the earth, and all of his creation. So to look at it or to study it and understand it just basically does not imply this foolish sense of worship or divination, so forth and so on. And we're not speaking about this horoscope and so-called modern astrology, which is a particular Gentile white Western interpretation it's a particular interpretation according to their own narratives or, for lack of a better word, their own gospel, you know, the story that they believe is written, you know, saying in the stars. But the Bible also uses in the scriptures, and the word of God also uses the stars, you understand, to tell this great story that we all who are alive and witness the events in these times, especially 
2012 now and beyond and survive these days, we will know that truly the witness, you understand, was there in the stars and what the scriptures has told, you understand, was to come to pass, but there was a false prophecy. You understand, we've been touching on as black Hebrews and black Jews and Ethiopian Hebrews and Rastafari, we've spoken a lot on the racial identity of, of Jesus Christ, of Yeshua HaMoshiach, touched on the ancient Egyptians. And the system, the trick, Babylon tries to keep us on that kind of racial level because it also tends to keep us on that flesh level and not really recognizing the spirit, the higher level, you understand, recognizing that we are even just more than the flesh, but try to keep us either on the flesh level, the racial level, or the body conscious kind of ness level, or, or the, the, the vanity, you know, the, the kind of vanity of, of the beast in man. You know, that's what it means by worshiping the image of the beast. So we've learned of the true humanity of our black Lord and Savior, Joshua. That's important. But we constantly try to remind ourselves, as well as our brothers and sisters, don't get stuck there on the racial level and not, and not experience, you know, words, not know the truth, not do the will, you know, and not fulfill the will. In other words, not work out your salvation. In other words, Moses was learned in the wisdom of Egypt, but he was mighty in what word? So he understood the logos or the logic as well as the truth or the manifestation, the deed. This is the only way that we will overcome and be those overcome or, or those truly saved, in other words, ones. But what does the Bible teach? It does teach of a reward. There will be a reward for the saved. Now, we touch on the word dechna or dehna in classic um, or classical, we say Ethiopia, you understand? We'll say the Ethiopia previous to its emergence more into the modern world scene, say circa 1930. Um, and even during the, the, the Zemen and Negus and Neges, it was true that when ones would um, meet and greet and exchange salamta, you know, uh, greetings with ones and ones, that one may ask, um, you know, in Demina Derek, you know, or, or in Demina and Demanesh, you know, how have you spent the night, so forth and so on. And the response to it would be like, Dechna Neng, or Ine Dechna Neng, you know, like, I'm what a Giziavi you mask in. And we want to focus on that for a moment, that in learning the royal Amharic from and according to the teaching of his majesty. Not just learning just, you know, you could because you could just learn how to go to a restaurant and order a meal and impress, you know, some natives in other words, you know, like that you can kind of parrot the language. But from a from a discipleship perspective, it's, it's really learning the word and the meaning of the word and meditating on that meaning. So we meditated on the word Dethna, and as we studied scripture and found out that, well, the Savior is the Medhane Alem, and he's called the Adan and the Adain, you know, and then we can get the Adonai, or from the Hebrew, we see the connection between the Savior of the Afro Shemitic, of, of the Ethiopic and the Amharic, right? We have the Lord, or the Adonai, the Adoni of the Hebrews or our Lord and Savior, Joshua. So we can see the connection linguistically according to the etymology. Now, the idea of being saved means that one is of that positive hope and affirmation and is also working out living that experience of Christos in the real world. So as they learn of the truth, they seek to um, become conscious of themselves, it must measure themselves by God's perfect example, by Christ, and recognize his wisdom is more perfect, his way is perfect, more perfect than our own way, and our own way, which is really how we've been programmed in the matrix or the Babylon system, is what keeps us, you understand, 
in this this spiritual captivity or in another way of metaphor verbal hieroglyphics in the spiritual Egypt or in the underworld the duat the duat the sheol or this hell on earth so to speak so of course seeing how the earth and living in the so-called world is one would want to go to a paradise or a heaven or a better sort of place so even in the ancient world their idea of what we would call quote heaven end quote very strict quotations around that what we would call paradise paradise refers actually to a garden you understand know refers to a gennet which is kind of interesting even paradise and heaven in this theological or biblical context gets confused just like a hell and the grave and and uh, Sheol these words or Gehenna you know it gets confused in, in in the Western Gentile sense so when you really become conscious of the word you understand and this and, and, and how we're using the word and how the word affects our present reality and our futures you understand I mean how how much power each of us as an individual has been given in the sight of the Almighty if we would only become awake, aware, conscious, and faithful, you know, and work it out, and it's really the experience of it. You understand? Know so it's not just teaching these things, but it's also seeking to walk them out. You understand? Know to, to, to live them out so you know. That's where you come to the real gnosis. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So what is the reward of those who are who are saved? You understand? Or of the true followers of the elect, the true followers of Christos, the true followers of Cheru. Cherui. You understand? Cherui, you might think is Horus, but actually Horus is Christ and Christ is Horus and Horus is the prophecy of Christ fulfilled in Rastafari. So it begins from Ethiopia and fulfills in Ethiopia. Anyway, the belief in going to heaven, right, at death is not only held by most professing Christians, it's all people in different religions around the world who also believe something similar. They cling to belief in some kind of an afterlife. There must be some type of reward, in other words, or a blissful afterlife after death. So this is irrespective, in a sense, of the particular religion. The interesting thing is that all kind of religions or belief systems among different people who might have had little to no interaction over vast spans of time with vastly different other people in other parts of the world, they all had similar belief systems, you understand, on some level. They have, they have similar aspirations, let's say that, that they express in, in their belief system. Now, surprising as it may seem, neither Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, Jesus, nor the apostles taught that the righteous, the Sadiqan, go to heaven when they die. Now this is this is very interesting. Now think about this for a moment. If this is not true, then we have to think about the opposite. If the opposite of this is true, but this belief that after you die you're going to heaven is not true biblically speaking. I mean think about it. Some of you all might have clicked on this video or checked this out because we you know worded the title speaking about this false prophecy or going to heaven after you die is not biblical. It is just totally not biblical. And we kind of discovered it from just grinding, you know, just, just on the scriptural grind, you know, meditating the word day and night. We say, wait, we, people keep talking about going to heaven, so let me find the verses for that in the Bible. And we started to search and look and study and like, whoa, that's not biblical. Where did they get this from? And then we see these Christians here in Tomorrow's World magazine, and if you get a free subscription, check them out on the Internet, you know, and there's some very interesting, you find some very interesting articles, and they're pretty honest, you know, pretty righteous Gentiles on that level, because they're recognizing what the logos is, what the logic, what the truth is. You, you, you see what I'm saying? So if somebody's practicing a Christianity, 
or Judaism that's not based on the scriptures and it's not referential to the scriptures or they putting forward a belief and you say, well, where, uh, how, how you know that where is it written and it's not written, but they still believe, you got to ask yourself what's going on here. You know what I'm saying? And this is what we've asked ourselves about nowadays, so-called, you know, this, this nowadays church, because many believe this. Now, the reward that Yeshua promises the faithful followers is not heaven. The reward for those who are the faithful followers, you know what I'm saying, the faithful overcomers, in other words, you know what I'm saying, it's immediate focus. It involves ruling with him, ruling with him on earth. In other words, ruling on earth. But if we look at the earth and what's going on in the world, we can clearly see that, that Christ's kingdom has not been established. And in fact, the kingdoms of this world are antagonistic to Christ's kingdom and government as the events of the creeping coup against Ketamawi, Haile Selassie in Ethiopia, 74-75, be becomes the most glaring testimony. You, you can say it's an open wound, not just for Ethiopia, but for this world. You understand? For this, for this world presently. Because the world stands in judgment right now. It's, it's on the cusp. You understand? This 2012 really is a particular celestial marking place of a cusp between the old so-called world, which the Bible talked about the world is fading away. It was speaking about this old world system. Even if it was 2,000 years, you would say, that's a long time. Not when you think about other ages being time-wise, as you count time, relatively longer. I mean, there's ages that go 10,000 years. There's ages that go 13 and even some say a 49,000 period. You understand? In which there was a conscious, you understand, there was a conscious self-governance and governance among, among beings, you understand, or, or say humans, you understand, or the divine, the gods, as they would say in ancient Egypt, or the ancestors, as ones would say in other belief um, systems. So now the early church which Christ established historically and biblically did not teach the concept of going to heaven, you know, of going to heaven. So we have to ask ourselves, where do people get these ideas from if it's not biblical? And, and why aren't the preachers preaching on this and teaching on this and really showing their, their, their fellow brothers and sisters in the Lord what doth the Savior says, what is written. Remember how Christ in his, in his, his humanity, he testified in, in his earthly um, um, visitation. What did he testify to him? Is it not written? Is it not written? It, it, it is written such and such. Is it not written? He was dealing with what was written, a testimony. You understand? He did not leave us without a so-called testimony. And it's the B-I-B-L-E, that's that testimony. So what's interesting is that the, the more we live and the more we witness and the more manifestation, we're seeing more and more the relevancy of the word of Jah or the scriptures and the irrelevancy of everything that we believe and people have believed and virtually given their, their, their hearts, their minds, bodies, souls, their, their lives for or the vanity of this world that the Bible says is fading away, you know what I'm saying, it's, it's, it's passing away. So the dominant view in the early church, it seems to have been that until the return of Adoni or the Lord upon the clouds of heaven to raise the dead, those who had died were asleep and that they would suddenly be awakened to be given their new bodies, after which they would reign with him on earth for a thousand years. That's like a summary of what the early church, based on different prophetical types in the prophets and in the Old Testament, because that was the scripture, it was like a synopsis, like when people, you ask Christians today, what do you think is going to happen? Some people believe the Left Behind movies. Other people believe other kind of things are going to happen, either spaceships 
or either some kind of rapture, they're going to disappear or float away or, you know, there's a lot of different, and they will give you these things as a summary, but then if you ask, well, give me the scriptures and verses that in your holy book, in your instruction manual that says, this and that, or tell me where you get these ideas from. And you'll be surprised sometimes. A lot of times, ones can't give you the evidence. This is why we point out, like, the books and stuff like that, and we're publishing these books because there needs to be the evidence. <laughs> you know what I mean? Not, not spout off a whole bunch of stuff and people say, well, okay, well, how can I find that out? <laughs> you know what I mean? It is written. You know what I mean? It is written. So the pen truly has a, a mightiness in and of itself. Now, this idea, now, this idea of going to heaven as our eternal destiny is not scriptural, it's not biblical. This idea did not gain wide acceptance, you understand, until well after the apostles themselves were off the scene, you understand? Rather, what Yeshua, what Jesus, Jesus, had plainly told his disciples, and this is what we must learn ourselves, as disciples, and as we even go forth as apostles to disciples, is bear witness to this truth, the logos, the word, the logic. No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man. So we began to think about this Son of Man thing. I said, that's interesting, this phraseology, the Son of Man. A lot of folks, they confuse what the Bible says about the Son of God and the Son of Man. They they, they don't see that there's a, a particular context. You cannot just say one is the other and the other is the one. You have to put it into its proper context. Now, the son of, 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 of man, in the Hebrew sense, would be the son of Adam. You know what I'm saying? It would be the, the Bain Adam, the son of Adam. Now, from an, an e Egyptian mysteries that Moses was well aware of, you know what I'm saying, but instead he gave a repointing to who our Ethiopian Hebrew ancestors, but there's a reflection even within the mysteries that are also principally according to the principle and type are true. You know, so when we see Osiris and Horus. Uh, Osar and Harui, if we would study these things biblically and in their context, you'd be amazed to find that there's a certain truth. Now, a lot of folks approach it from a, a, a religious Pharisaicism, you, you know, and a kind of a cynicism to anything that's outside of a white Western Gentile concept. Well, that's a part of the blindness, uh, you know, of the God that they worship. You know what I'm saying? The blind God or the God of this world. He cannot see anything above him. He refuses to look up at the one above him, at those immortals who were above him. So it says that no one has ascended right to heaven. You know what I'm saying? But he who came down from heaven, and that is the son of Adam. So now if we ask ourselves scripturally, who was the son of Adam? You know what I'm saying? Now there was, well, Cain seems to be the son of Eve, while Abel was more the son of Adam, but the fulfillment would be Seth, the Hebrew Seth. You understand? Make a distinction there. The Hebrew Seth, right? The Hebrew Seth or the Hebrew Seth, right? So now in the book of Enoch, which is another title that we are looking forward to publish as well, there's a couple of different versions of the book of Enoch, as well as the book of Jubilees, even the book of Adam and Eve called the Gedla Adam. We are see, we, it's, it's in publication, even as I and I speak. Now, these are some Ethiopic holy books and scriptures that was known in ancient times and in the early church, but were only preserved because of the war you understand, against the true Christians or the Gnostic Christians that occurred centuries ago that many fled to Ethiopia like the nine saints. They built monasteries. Um, they translated scriptures. You, you, you know, they, they preached and, and taught and, and converted many to the true way of Christ, which we call Tawahida or our, our, our Ethiopic 
you know what I'm saying, um, Judeo-Christian, you know what I'm saying, um, Christianity, our divine heritage for sure, our divine heritage, right? So the Apostle Peter, he said that the obedient King David, a man after God's own heart, get this, Acts of the Apostles 13 and 22, is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day, for David did not ascend into the heavens. Now, think of this for a moment. Although some might have doubted it and still want to doubt it, but when it speaks of the ascension of Yeshua, you understand, not only do we have, even in the Bible, a very interesting, for lack of a better word, uh, E.T. phenomena, Ethiopian phenomena or extraterrestrial sort of phenomenon in his ascension, you understand, but also a clear connection in the context of what this is saying, that Yeshua said that none can ascend unless they come from there, you understand, unless they come from there. And so that, that's very interesting because most other cultures did not attempt to build rockets, but they did have certain belief in, in, in the heavens and the connection with ancestors in the heaven, other cultures. But they never attempted to build physical kind of rockets, yet we have testimonies of many civilizations that they find a lot of the ruins and they find a couple of bodies here and there, but they don't find the number of bodies that they would expect to find, bones and stuff like that. They don't find this in many ancient sites. And this has been recorded over the centuries since Europeans have started to, you know, dig up and excavate many of these ancient um, indigenous and native people um, cultures. Even righteous King David did not go to heaven when he died. He went to Sheol, you understand, or he went to the underworld, physically to the Mechabir, to the tomb, the body, but on the psychic level to the Sheol or to what's known as the Duat, you understand, when he died, he is still dead from our perspective, right, as well as all the righteous men and women who have died. Now, there's an interesting um, early Christian story speaking about Christ, I think it's in Nicodemus, where he, after the crucifixion, he took a, you could say he took a trip, in a sense, to Sheol and kind of broke up, you know, that kind of underworld. He broke up that underworld conspiracy, and he even came to the saints in the Sheol state, you understand, in that particular underworld or, or death state. You understand, where, biblically speaking, they were alive, but not from our, you know, not that the connection, there was no, there's a, there's a, there's a gulf between these, these particular worlds. And since they were of the righteous, they were in a better district, you can say, of the underworld than those. And, this, and, and you know, this was an early Christian teaching concerning Christ and concerning what happened when he went down into hell or to Sheol, you understand, how he delivered up the saints, you understand, there. And, and the connection is when we look at ancient Egypt and we start looking at the mysteries and we start comparing them, we're seeing the same theology may be expressed here with the son of Adam, and there with the son of Osiris or Horus, we see it in those sort of languages, but there's a lot of correspondence that needs to be understood from this. Now, they are awaiting the resurrection from the dead, at which time they will receive spirit bodies. Now, they often like to put in spirit bodies. The Bible says they will receive bodies. This is the key thing. Now, the body has is tripartite. It has spirit soul, and then a carbon, organic, or flesh. That's the trinity that's in man. So they will receive bodies that will never die or that are not subject to degeneration. This is what it means that they will never die. You understand? Because it's really the body in that sense and the soul through sin that, that in that sense dies. You understand? Or in a spiritual sense, because of sin, the soul on a level 
it exists in the next dimension, but according to its measure of, of sin, it has built up karma in the sense of over here they talk about reincarnation. That sometimes people who, when they ask about the man who had sinned, was it his ancestor? Did he do something? And, and Christ did not dismiss that those could be possibilities. He explained that this is for the glory of God because he's going to heal that particular man. You know what I'm saying? So this is for God's glory and not getting into whatever past things. So there is a kind of a link even in the biblical, you understand, theology on certain points. We shouldn't go too far and say it's just like other so-called religions or religious, what you call them, but we should try to understand the principles and what the ancient peoples either knew or recognized as certain truth that we find in many different cultures irrespective of other um, beliefs on the outer or even the inner levels right there. So now 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 50 to 53, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 to 17. Now the interesting thing is, and we've touched on this before, but it's an important point, is that when one, is, when one repents and when one is born again, according to the Bible, and they become a Christian or they be a witness to uh, Joshua or Yeshua as Adoni or as Adonai, as Lord, in other words, as Master, they now have entered in, in other words, to the, 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 the field or the sifero or the world spiritually into a consciousness that biblically is called the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of the heavens. This is the truth of the matter. So in other words, this is saying that when one becomes a Christian, in a sense, I mean truly in spirit, in some real experiential level, some real, it's not just out of mouth, but it's really a heart and a mind thing, a consciousness thing, right, and with knowledge, you understand, of the scriptures, of his word, of the master's word, which are life, they enter in to the kingdom of heaven. So now the, the counterfeit church, you understand, so-called counterfeit Christianity or the majority of Christianity teaches that ones go to heaven after they die. And while they live, they look to go to heaven in a very, Ignorant sense. First of all, it's ignorant because it's not what Yeshua taught. It's not what Jesus Christ taught. It's not what the Bible teaches. We find no doctrine, no teaching for that in, in, in the thousands of years of manuscripts going back to, as you would say, the founder of the firm, our black Lord and Savior, Joshua HaMoshiach. You understand? So where do they get this from? You understand? And then when you look at biblically, what the Bible says the process is, you know, what the, what the conversation or the process is, we find that when one is born again, in other words, when one is born again and goes through that, 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 that repentance, that metanoia, that change of mind, you always send from doing things their way to doing things Yah's way, you understand, know with Yeshua, with, with our our Savior as that template, as that testimony, that, that imare, that demonstration for us. So, because we can't say with Yeshua that we can fulfill, be in-laws, you understand, of our elder brother, of our big brother, of Yeshua. Because we are, so we can, as he was a, a, a perfection of the law, we can going from faith to faith and growing up to him and seeking to walk these things out, to manifest them, because it's that experience that gives us wisdom. You see, and some might have the knowledge, but knowledge by itself, it puffs up. It's that experience now that really gives us that wisdom so that we can have the potential to be overcomers. But they keep the, 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 the Christians... You understand? And this is, a, this is a bad wickedness that goes on. A lot of folks may not like I and I saying this, but the Bible even testifies. You understand? The Bible even testifies that many will 
come in my name. I and I as Rastafari, we come in the new name. You know what I'm saying? So this is our testimony. But getting back to the basics right here, eternal life, this issue of eternal life is the gift of Jah. Eternal life is the gift of Jah. You see, so that's, that is what the gift, in that sense, or that reward, if you really look at it, is Romans 6 and 23, which those who are born of the spirit and the truth of the logos of the word, those who are born as, as John chapter 1, what we call the Gnostic gospel or the metaphysical gospel, because that now gives you, gives you the um, experience. You know, as John, in a sense, becomes the experience um, from the, it, it, it's a subjective experience. You know what I'm saying? When you, when you read John's gospel, the other gospels, so not the gospels, they give you a kind of an overview, a general structure. While John's gospel, in a, in a very special way, it really gives you Christ intimately, you understand, in the sense of the grace of Jah. This is why it begins off at, at such a, a metaphysical kind of level. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. I mean, you know, even one's not religious, you hear that and you say, wow, that's some, that's some flowetry, poetry. But then even on an intellectual level, you start to really, as I say, break that down. You know, and not only is it a formula, it is something that one must, must take to heart and mind. You see, and that's part of the process of growing up, you understand, of growing up. So it's not that religion is a, or spirituality, moreover, is a passive thing. The religion, in a sense, it gives us certain of the main rules of conduct so we can practice and perfect our spirituality and reach and overcome and receive that gift of Jah, which is eternal life, which those who are spirit-born, you know, spirit and truth born, those who are, you could say, of Christ, of the Moshiach, of Christians, they are to receive or Kabbalah, Ebele, you understand, they receive this when they are resurrected or changed. You see, those who have already passed away, it speaks about in that sense, they are to be resurrected. But it says that some would be alive during those times of change, you understand? And they will be changed in those times of change, and they will go from the mortality, which we are born into the mortality, what is Madsy testified. I am, I am a man. I am mortal. I will be replaced by the oncoming generation. He testified to that reality. You see, because only during that trance, there is a, there is a transformation or a time of change. You see, just because one says, I am a Christian, you saying once you're born through the matrix of the womb, you come into this mortality. You, you, this is the, that's the first world that we're born into. But one must be born again. You saying that now puts you on the, the right track or the right path, you know, saying the true path to the kingdom in Yeshua, right? Now, what is the reward that Yeshua will bring with him? See, so we want to just dismiss this false idea about going to heaven after you die. It's not scriptural. And I and I have looked for it. And you know, I and I, if we have found it, you know, if we really said that, we'll say, hey, you know, even if we personally have a little difficulty in, in fully accepting it, if we were to find a verse like that, we still will give that verse and say, hey, it says right there. No, when Christ is speaking about the kingdom of heaven, it's like when he's speaking about the leaven. You know, we've talked about the leaven as an example, that he was using the leaven as a verbal hieroglyph, as an example. But the disciples thought he actually meant don't eat the bread that the Pharisees or the religionists have at their, their, their picnic or their, their feast, their festival. You understand? So they went there fasting, thinking that it was the fast, and they came back hungry, and Christ said, why, why, why you look all tired? What's wrong? And he said, well, we didn't eat any bread. And he said, why? Because you said the, the leaven, 
of the Pharisees, and he had explained to them that he was using parabolic logic. He was using metaphorical, metaphysical speech. He was using almost a word, as you would say, as a slang. You understand? He was using a, one word to signify something else, but they didn't get it. In other words, they wasn't in that spirit. You know what I'm saying? They was not in that spirit, they was not in that mind, or they were looking at it so-called too literal. So maybe ones began to look at it literal after the time of the apostles and down to this time to the so-called um, church, you know what I'm saying, practicing counterfeit Christianity and illegal Jehovah worship, you know what I'm saying, is teaching or is, is telling people that you're going to go to heaven after you die. But that's not a biblical. See, we thought as Rastafari, Bob Marley song, we thought that it was Bob Marley and the Whalers. You know, they said it in, in, in the song, you know, some people think great God, you know, you know, was, was, you know, come from the sky, take away everything, make you feel high, you know, uh, looking for yours, you know, after death, so forth and so on. But really, some thought that was secular. Some even, you know, was like Rastafari, is not being very biblical, but really, most of them didn't know what the Bible said. So what Bob said in that particular song, what this article is saying right here, is saying that a lot of people, especially a lot of Christians, are believing and lie something which is not said anywhere here. You understand? Something's not, it's not said anywhere in the Bible. You know, something that, and a major belief. It's not a minor belief. You know, when you, sometimes when I'm, in a situation where somebody's had like a loved one that's passed away and, you know, you hear people say things like, um, well, they're in a better place or they're in heaven or, you know, I, I think what the government does say, like, sorry for your loss, you know, that's, 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 um, that's probably the best thing right there, you know, because you, know, you know the person is suffering something if the person meant anything to them. But um, that being said, Christ said this, that at his return, he will reward all overcomers. That means all of those who have overcome. That means that there is a battle. There's some sort of a spiritual, at least, and on some level even temporal, but spiritual, first and foremost, you understand, battle, and even a psychical battle, you understand, before victory. So, but those who overcome now, all who grow, all who grow in spiritual character of God, or all who grow in the spiritual character of Jah, in other words, the word become flesh, that Jah's word, his word becomes our flesh and blood action. Then we become worthy for that gift, which is eternal life. You understand? Because we've done all in our power, you understand, to conform ourselves to his will to make our wills obedient to his will and not just to do whatever we will and perish in the oblivion, you understand, with these people living in a non-reality, in an unreality, right, in a man-made reality and, and, and delusion. Now, all who grow in spiritual character of God, some will overcome and grow more than others. In other words, some depends on each one's will to make their will obedient. So some will grow. You understand, more than others. And we're speaking spiritually. You understand? And um, Yeshua said that he, quote, will reward each according to his works. So there we have kind of an example, even from the Egypts, the Egypts of like Osiris, Osar, in, in, in the judgment hall. You know, that same kind of scene in a sense where he will reward each according to his particular works as they're weighed. You know, saying against that feather, and that feather is symbolic of what? The word or truth. The feather is of the dual truth, the truth of the father and the son, that one's heart, one's intent, one's heart is now weighed against that feather. So it's still a biblical or Hebraic and Ethiopic. It's Ethiopic in its root, and it's Hebraic in the sense of its refinement, bringing it to our present time, but the rootage, you see, we have to look at those roots right there, Matthew 16 and 27, Revelation 22 and 12. Now, John's saints, the Kedusan, now the Kedusan are a class and the righteous are a class too. A lot of folks sometimes don't really pay attention that when it says saints, 
is talking about Kedusan. And a Kedus is one who sets himself apart, almost like a Nazarene or a Nazarite. You set yourself apart. You understand? That means you, you're making a conscious effort to set yourself apart, you understand, to be conformed to his will. That means there's a process of, of denial of self. So you have to deny, there has to be a denial of self and acceptance of himself. And in that process of, 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 of study and prayer, you understand, meditation and, and, and working it out and testifying, you understand, and I'm not talking about a soapbox standing on the corner, and, and, and if that is one's call, so be it. But, but one, what I and I are speaking about is a living testimony. This is in your heart and your mind, and you're conforming your will to the Savior's will, to his truth, because it's only that truth, in that sense, that can get through this, this, this time to come. You know, this, this firewall that can get through the firewall is only his truth. Anything else, that's when people say, um, you know, like, like, like there's many ways to God. We say, no, there's many ways to something you might want to call God, but there's only one true way, and that's in Yeshua. That's in the Yeshua. So now, John's saints are not going to be strumming on harps, so-called up in heaven for eternity. And there's not going to be a bunch of pudgy, fat, white baby floating around, you understand, up there, or Peter Philly, or any of that. There's not going to be any of that there, as you've seen in so-called the classical European, you understand, European and, and Anglo-American um, uh, counterfeit Christianity. It's not going to. It's not going to be like that at all. And even these, I think, they're white Christians. At least they admit that truth. A lot of ones are not able to even do that much. That's a, that's a start. That's a step. Their destiny is infinitely more glorious and exciting for the Kedusan. Now, what the Metaph Kedus, or what you know as the Bible, what it reveals is that the, quote, reward of the saved, the reward of the saved will be rulership of the earth. This is what this whole warfare and this, you know, it's like in a warfare, there's confusion on the battlefield. Sometimes that's purposeful. You know, it's like in the old Kung Fu movies where one before he, he kicked somebody, he did something, he go, he or he make a sound. And that sound was to almost like frighten, like a, like a lion or some animals, a dog will bark. And if it's barking on somebody, it's so that the dog can rate the reaction to its bark and smell how much fear is there and know whether to attack or to retreat. You understand? So in the same sense, we get these um, animals among men in this present time who are not conscious enough to recognize John's sign, you understand, and recognize what time, but continue. It's like um, James talked about that the wicked, you know, they're just stacking up dollars in the last day, you understand, before the fire come and burn everything up, and you have to say, wow, that's deep because we see this going on. You know, I mean, yeah, some of these people are already rich. You know, they don't have a problem so much as far as financially, but it's like they have a sickness. And, you know, the, the, the outer acts are just a fruit of something else going on on the inside because they, they have a denial of service to Christ. And therefore, you see they're going into that madness. You understand? So those ways can't lead... You know, they're going to have to give that up. You understand? They've got to give that up. But the, the true reward of the save is rulership on earth, you understand, with Yeshua HaMoshiach, with the Son of Man, after he returns, Revelation 2 and 26, Revelation 3 and 21, Revelation 5, and we touched on Revelation 5 already, 5 and 10. 5 and 10. These are the verses in Revelation that speaks about what some interpret as Christ's return. We interpret scripturally that the return, it, it, it is a, he is the ever coming one because, because he is the eternal one. This is why the eternal is the circle or the cipher. So he is the ever coming one, you understand? But it's really the unveiling or the revelation of Christ. You know what I'm saying? Because he is here even in our midst. He says that when two or three are gathered together, he is in 
our very midst. He says, um, I will be with you to the end of the world. So we are still approaching this time of the end of the world, and thus he is still with us. But to those who are living in the world, um, they cannot see past the veil. So there will be a, a, an unveiling, in other words. But this connection with Christ and the return of Jesus Christ and the rulership, we see it biblically going into these scriptures ourselves as being fulfilled in Hila Selassie, and we have an opportunity to be a part of that fulfillment even right now. Even I them who are studying this and watching and taking notes are also taking advantage of that opportunity to be a part of the fulfillment. The first thing we have to know is what has been fulfilled and what is to be fulfilled and what are the scriptural and otherwise heavenly signs concerning it so we can also know how to walk you understand, through the valley of the shadow of this death. Now, just as Christ and the resurrected Christians shall rule for a thousand years, according to Revelation 20, verses 4 to 6. I see that as being fulfilled actually in Rastafari, and there's an interesting connection even when we consider the monarchy, you understand, in Ethiopia and the events, you understand, of... Um, the great transgression, the rebellion against the King of Kings in um, recent times is also biblical and prophetical as well, and we find a correspondence and revelation to that. But in this time, this thousand-year rulership, the duty now of the Kedusan, of the Holy Ones, is to teach the nations. So there's going to be a cataclysmic time. You understand? I mean, things as we know it now, are going to, no doubt, most likely, I mean, we've already been seeing the signs of it, tornadoes, storms, earthquakes, disasters, and that's not to mention what men and people do, you understand, and, and, and the demons riding a lot of the um, um, heavily burdened, you know, men and people, but the duty now of the elect, of the cheruya, you understand? The duty of the elect will be to teach the nations Jah's way of life. That means the elect, if I and I is to be the elect, we must know what his way of life is. You understand? Know and create that consciousness even in an hour environment. That's what Sabbath and Sendbet is, is, is so important in more ways than just the obvious, just the basic you know, the basic ways that is clearly obvious that keeping the sentiment of the Shabbat is, even just from a health-wise, you understand, um, the whole psychology of just taking a, you know, taking a day to refresh and spiritually reboot is, you know, is beneficial. But there's also another level because there are the annual Sabbaths and there are the weekly Sabbaths. And since these align with John's witness, you understand, of the stars, it's very interesting how we've been having a lot of correspondence in some of the Hebrew holidays to some significant events, you know, um, astrologically in the environment and the earthquakes, other things that we've noticed as certain holy days or times um, roll around. There's something like an alignment of the heavenly cloth, also with the temporal or the material reality, but men and people are living in their own delusion. They're living in their own manufacture, in their own creation. It's like they're worshiping like the parable and the prophets. They're worshiping the work of their own hands, and they're, and they're denying service to the true creator, and the true creator is even lovingly trying to show them the signs and even inspire and pour his spirit among many ones and ones to reveal the, the um, amount of truth, the measure of truth they're able by these means and others, and still a lot of folks are, are not getting it. But be that as it may, the elect will be teachers of the nation. They will teach John's way of life. Now, this shall bring truly a lasting peace, because his majesty teach us, I and I peace. Peace is not an is, it's a becoming. There are many day-to-day um, -day calculations and different things that are necessary among, among men and men and people and people as among the environment, 
as among nations and groups and differences of family and clan and even within a family, when we're talking about peace in the fullness of shalom, in the fullness of shalom in the home. Just wanted to say that, you know. Um, so they would teach John's way of life. They would teach Torah. You understand? They will finally teach the Orit, Torah, Jah's wisdom in Christ, in the Moshiach, to the nations. You understand? In Christ and his kingly character to the nations. And this will finally, after these days of tribulation, after these time of tribulation, you understand, will bring in lasting peace, prosperity, and truly joy to Humanity. I mean, and and this is a time that in our prayers is a very good prayer. It says, "Pray that you be found worthy to stand before the Son of Man." I mean, that should be one of the brotherhood prayers that we be found worthy to you know to experience that fulfillment. You understand know that real fulfillment because the opposite of that truth is just a lie and destruction. You understand? And kind of a lostness in the black hole, in the void. You understand? Why do you think all these black holes are we've gone a little bit ahead of ourselves? Now, this does not mean that the resurrected um, saints, that the resurrected Kedusan, the resurrected holy ones or the holy ones of this time may never visit heaven or may never visit the heavens wherein God the Father resides. You understand? That's that's not to say that that they will never visit the heavens. That's why ones need to get up on this wisdom. You understand of the stars and the real biblical connection. I mean, it's really so interesting. And now that we know a lot much more, and there's a lot of different investigations, Maya and this and that, and and and, and now we look at the Bible in its proper context. It's like wow, the Bible kind of says the same thing. You know, the only view that doesn't know this is this end time Babylon is like most ignorant of this, is always denying it, but it's like everyone else knew it, and we look at their ages compared to our age, it's like we're accumulating all of the debt, in a sense, from all the ages previously. It's about debt in the future. There is a psychic and a sin debt, not just on one nation or one people, but on all humanity. You know what I'm saying? And mainly because of their ignorance, mainly re because they refuse to look up. You know, what does John say when you see these days and time? He says, look up, look up. You know what I'm saying? Not just look up just into the clouds, but recognize the witness of the stars, right? Recognize that. Um, now, the point is that we will have work, John's work or John's business, to do. Now, we try to touch on a little bit of the same subject matter, this preparatory subject matter, in our, I think it was the Malkaz Edek and, and the priesthood, building up the priesthood series that we, we taught previously, you know, was, you know, that we introduced a little bit. But there's, there is, there's a beauty, it's in the scriptures. It's, it's, the Bible is, is, that, is that compass that will help us to navigate through this storm, this it's like a consciousness storm that we're already in. You, you know, it's like the first part of the storm, but we haven't gotten deep into it just yet. You know, was, but we're about to get deep into it. And, and many of us can kind of feel it, you know, within the air, as it were. It's like that calm before the storm, so to speak. Now, the, the job or, the, or the, the work, the business, will be focused on doing John the Father's will. You know what I'm saying? Doing his will here on earth. And for us as the elect Arastafari and for the faithful Ethiopian Hebrews, it is to fulfill, you understand, that new age vision of the King of Kings and his Christ. And we get a glimmer of it, you know, you know was in the visitation of Haile Selassie. You know what I'm saying? We get a glimmer of it. You know, was, we, we get a glimmer of it, but that sets kind of like a basic template. It was almost like the tabernacle that was originally, um, I think, at Shiloh for a time. Remember Shiloh's tabernacle was there until the sinfulness of the priests, and that would be transferred to the church when we connected, you know, Ethiopically or the priesthood, the Pharisees, the men and the people, 
because Christ didn't condemn Judaism as far as the teachings. He condemned that generation of men and people, you know, understand, who was denying access to that gnosis to the people to keep them in a kind of slavery, a spiritual slavery or a bondage, right? So um, we will rule under directly under Yeshua HaMoshiach. This is the interesting thing, under Yesus Christos. Now, I mentioned the connection with Abu Kadus, Haile Selassie, as our father, you know what I'm saying, as the father that's being spoken of here, but we have to get our house in order. That means we have to recognize that Yeshua, you understand, is Adonai, is Adoni. He is Lord. See, a Lord is the next level down from a king. A king is usually, in that sense, right, not a Lord, like a Lord and a king, but when you understand the mystery of the ma'at and the feather, you understand, the feather has a dual truth. There's, there is the dual truth. There are two truths. There's the truth of spirit and there's the truth of manifestation or, or of truth, in other words, of the, like, like the truth of the divinity and the truth of humanity. There's truth of the Father. There's the truth of the Son. And when we study numbers and we learn how to count righteously, learn how to count, that two right there points to that divine duality as we have of the Father and the Son. We have Christ testifying of the Father and the Son. And I and I testify that His Majesty, Kedemawi Haile Selassie, is that revelation of the fatherhood that Christ spoke of. You know what I'm saying? In John's Gospel and in the other Gospels, you know, was, and that Jesus Christos, you know what I'm saying, is that gateway for us.